The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For more, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we aren't responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Frank Watto, here with my great friend, Dr. Paul Delson-Williams. Paul, how was that? <laughs> really really good, Matt. It felt natural. <laughs> I, you get better every time. Yeah, for the audience, I've been in the basement drinking coffee for the past five hours, trying to psych myself up for this podcast episode. <laughs> Tonight, we are talking about uh, colon polyps with the great Dr. Jennifer Maranke, and uh, we'll tell you all about her in a second. Um, this was a really practical episode, Paul. I, I always am unsure like when to follow up. And, and we also talked about a lot of other cool stuff, bowel preps, what is a low residue diet, you know, things that were on my wish list for a long time here. Finally, I just, you know, had cause to ask somebody about them. Yeah, it turns out even defining the quality of the bowel prep actually has meaning, which was exciting to find out. So yeah, really, I think really actionable stuff. So before you introduce our super co-host, Paul, would you please tell the audience, what is it that we do on the Curbsiders? Sure. Happy to. As per usual, we are the internal medicine podcast. We use expert interviews to review clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. As you alluded to, we are joined by super co-host and super producer, Dr. Elena Gibson, um, who put this episode together. Elena, how are you? Great. (laughs) <laughs> I'm super. Great. <laughs> Both great to hear. Um, why don't I let you tell us about who we talked to and what we talked about? Yeah, sure. So we had a great conversation with our guest, Dr. Jennifer Marenki. We talked all about the definitions of advanced adenomas, serrated polyposis, uh, what to do whenever you have different results on an and an endoscopy report, uh, how to make sense of what the next steps are. And Jennifer Marenki, she is a gastroenterologist and advanced endoscopist. She focuses on improving quality and access in endoscopy. She's the director of endoscopy at Penn State Hershey Medical Center, where she is currently collaborating with her colleagues in internal medicine and family medicine to develop colon cancer screening programs. So very applicable to this episode. Uh, in her free time, she likes enjoying the outdoors in the sweetest place on earth. And she has recently become a golf nut. All right. And Paul, you know, uh, you'll be sad to know that I didn't have time to look up any uh, colon puns before this what? one. So, <laughs> Of all the episodes. You, you you know, know, okay, Paul, fine. You, you forced me into it. So, Paul, I, I have some news. I, I had to have uh, part, part of my colon removed. For what? <laughs> Sorry to hear that, man. So now I, I have a semicolon. It's a, punctu- <laughs> it's a punctuation joke, Paul. For for the listeners at home, Matt is looking off camera, so he's reading this off the screen. So there, oh, I also there was some research. Oh, I also just wanted to give a shout out to my colon for doing me a solid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks to punstoppable.com dot com for those colon puns. A reminder that this and most episodes will be available for CME credit through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. Jen, it's been great talking. Uh, I want to let the audience in on this. So can you give them like a one-liner and tell them a hobby or interest that you have outside of medicine? Sure. So I am a gastroenterologist and advanced endoscopist, and I'm interested in quality and endoscopy. I have a special interest in colon cancer screening. I'm married with two kids, two daughters, and I love hanging out with the people that are most important to me. Of note, I recently became a golf nut. So if you ever want to go golfing, give me a call. (laughs) Paul, are you a golfer? You know, I tried like early on when I thought that I wanted to be wealthy when I grew up, I, I tried golfing and like, I just, I could not have been worse at it. Like I never hit a straight drive ever. Like even at the range, it was just, I was the one where you heard the consistent thwunk of the golf ball bouncing off the barrier next to me. So I, I gave up on it. It just made me, it made me too mad. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, Paul. I, I don't, I don't enjoy golfing either. I mean, when, I feel like when you have a podcast, like you, you, you can't golf as well. Like your, your partners can only put up with so much. So I, this is, this is <laughs> my right. hobby that takes, this is my hobby that takes a million hours. Sure. Fair enough. Uh, Jen, my usual question is, uh, 
Here comes the neighbor with the garage door. Hold, oh, please. Classic. <laughs> just, uh, just be one moment. Did we give this guy a nickname yet? <laughs> No, I'm not even sure it's a guy, to be honest. I don't ever – It's blessedly, I don't actually see my neighbors very often, which is great. Um, they just drive in and so out. We'll, we'll let them close the garage door, and then we'll continue. <laughs> to resume, Jen, so my usual question is um, tell me a piece of culture that you've enjoyed recently. It doesn't even have to be medically related, but it can be book, movie, whatever you like that you just that you enjoyed, you think our audience would enjoy as well. Okay. I have a, a couple of books. Um, my all-time favorite fictional book is All the Light We Cannot See. Uh, by Anthony Doerr. Uh, recently, however, I'm planning a trip to Ireland, and so I've gotten into the mysteries of Tana French, um, and all of her stories are set in small Irish towns. And then I, I do recognize that I'm about seven years late to this game, but I have recently become obsessed with Hamilton um, and listen to the Hamilton soundtrack every day. Might I recommend uh, Weird Al's Hamilton Polka, <laughs> which I which I I am not saying this ironically. I think it's a masterpiece. So check it out, oh. people. Okay, I'll check it out. It's high praise. It's high praise. Yeah, my 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 boys uh, were really into Weird Al and Hamilton Polka. Uh, that was that was their gateway to Hamilton. Was Hamilton Polka, and then they were. I was like, you know, this is based on an actual like uh, play, and then they got into the actual Hamilton. It's pretty funny. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> All right, Elena, the floor is yours. All right. So my pick of the week today is a band. And I'm going to try to pronounce the name right, but it's Krongbin. It's a trio out of, I think, Texas. And they have a recent album where they do some like mashups with Leon Bridges, too. But it's like psychedelic soul. Very good. Paul, have you heard this? Nope, not at all. <laughs> no, my time has passed. It's <laughs> never I think too Paul's late. Just drifting slowly towards death now. Most yeah. of Paul's new music recommendations now come from Elena on air. I think that's the... <laughs> no, that's hundred percent true. It's Elena is my Spotify. <laughs> you can find me. Yeah. Um, uh, you know what? Before I guess one last question, Jen, for you before we get to the case, um, I wanted to know: Did you have? Uh, favorite advice or feedback or, or just a, a quality piece of advice or feedback that you wanted to share with the audience that maybe someone's given to you along the course of your career? Yeah, sure. Um, and this is actually a piece of advice that I'm very thankful for. And I have applied it. I heard it um, probably close to 20 years now, 20 years ago now. And uh, it still applies. And I pass it on uh, frequently, at least every year to some other, <clears throat> you know, trainees or people who are coming up so Dr. Daryl Moyer, who was my program director at the time when I was a Temple Internal Medicine resident, uh, mentioned to me that a career in medicine is a marathon, not a sprint. And I really think it continues to apply to my life. And it applies, I think, to all of us, um, whether we're in academic medicine or in private practice or working for systems. I think um, there really is something to be said for st uh, slow and steady because it helps keep you in the game. Yes. Darylin, of course, very wise. Paul and I also lucky enough to know her. And uh, she she has lots of quotes that I think of often, I will say. This episode is sponsored by ExpressVPN. And audience, you know what? I love ExpressVPN. I love having a VPN because when I'm doing work for the curbsiders, I can't always work at home. I have to work in public places. Maybe it's a library. Maybe it's a coffee shop. And I want a secure connection. I want my information to be encrypted. So it's easy whether I'm on my laptop or my phone. I throw on ExpressVPN and I know that my browsing history is safe. Maybe you just want some more privacy on the internet. Well, ExpressVPN can provide that because if you're using your regular internet connection, your internet service provider, they can see all the websites you go to and they can even sell that information to make money off it. And hey, why should they make money off what I'm doing online? And I want my privacy. So ExpressVPN is great because it lets you browse anonymously. And as I said, it's easy to use on all your devices. So secure your online activity by visiting expressvpn.com slash curb today. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash curb. And you can get an extra three months free. Expressvpn.com slash curb. With that, let's let's get on to a case from Cashlack. So, Elena, do you want to start us off? Happy to. 
So our case today, we have a patient, Jeanette Simpson. She's 48 years old. She's coming to clinic, really just there to follow up for her yearly like diabetes management check. But since her last visit in the clinic, she did have a colonoscopy, uh, and she's asking you about that. It was for colorectal cancer screening, and it was notable for three polyps. So what additional information about the polyps is needed to determine appropriate follow-up in her case? So this kind of um, question comes up frequently, and it's very important that we look at the pathology of those polyps, and we first separate them between neoplastic and non-neoplastic polyps, and the type of polyps that are non-neoplastic that we most commonly see during colonoscopy are are going to be hyperplastic. Um, Those polyps are frequently found in the rectum and the sigmoid colon, and they don't substantially increase the risk of developing colon cancer. And they also, um, you know, require a different type of follow-up than adenomatous, precancerous, or neoplastic polyps do. Other types of non-neoplastic polyps are inflammatory polyps. We'll frequently see those in the setting of diverticular disease or chronic inflammation in the the colon, as well as hamartomatous polyps. Um, Now, hamartomatous polyps, if if the patient has a syndrome, those can have malignant potential. Um, on the other hand, neoplastic polyps, which are the ones that we mainly think about when we're talking about uh, having shorter intervals for colon cancer surveillance, are adenocarcinomas, uh, tubular adenomas, things like villus adenomas, tubular villus adenomas, and then also sessile serrated polyps. It's also important to um, find information on the size of the polyps, and this uh, helps determine the, uh, the surveillance interval. We see polyps anywhere in range from two millimeters, which is pretty much as small as you can see, to several centimeters. Uh, So it's important to note the size of those. And another important kind of delineation is polyps that are less than 10 millimeters in size or those that are greater uh, in 10 millimeters in size. Those are considered high-risk polyps and require closer follow-up. Now, in terms of location, where these polyps are located in the colon, it doesn't necessarily guide follow-up uh, interval, but it may provide in, insight into whether there's a, po- a polyposis syndrome. Um, additionally, hyperplastic polyps often look like sessile or serrated polyps under the microscope, and occasionally you'll have a, lar- a pretty sizable hyperplastic polyp in the right side of the colon, so say the ascending colon, and I usually chalk those up to being sessile serrated polyps uh, because it's the, the hyperplastic polyps are less commonly found on the right side of the colon. I, I think now is a good time to just like, just get it out of the way early. Like, I, I don't understand what sessile serrated polyps are. I mean, I, I, I mean, I understand more now because I've done some reading about them before this, but it, it's, it seems like they are, they have, they're treated differently than just your regular tubular anadoma. Can you talk a bit, little bit about like what they are and why they're, they're treated differently? Sure. So, um, Sessile serrated polyps look very much like hyperplastic polyps, which are just flat or minimally raised uh, little polyps, and they are very they have a, a very subtle endoscopic um, appearance. They're quite similar to the surrounding mucosa, whereas adenomas will have a distinct pit pattern. Uh, they're often more uh, red in color, and you can see them more readily. The sessile serrated polyps are very subtle sometimes, which is another reason why the quality of the bowel prep is so important. They're more frequently located in the proximal colon, and under the microscope, they share a lot of the same characteristics as the hyperplastic polyps. But they have a little bit um, more disorganization uh, and kind of serrated edges, which uh, is the reason why they're called sessile serrated polyps. Um, those are less likely to cause bleeding, um, but they are um, they're important to find because, first of all, they're very easily missed, and it's thought that having sessile serrated polyps um, increases the risk of developing colon cancer threefold compared to somebody having a normal colonoscopy. Um, and so they're very important to find. Uh, they're also very difficult to find. And so our um, our follow up recommendations are actually a little bit more stringent when we find sessile serrated polyps than a standard tubular adenoma. Yeah. So it's almost part of the reason for the shortened interval is just because you're just worried that it's if they make those type of polyps, it's more likely you might miss something be because missed. they're just harder to see. That's right. Okay. And so is it a mix of an endoscopic and histologic diagnosis? 
It is in in determining uh, if it's a sessile serrated polyp yeah. or no. The so the technically the the diagnosis of the polyp is going to be um, from the pathologist from the the histology. But I just sometimes I'm a little bit suspicious and sometimes I've gone back and asked the pathologist, hey, can you look at this again? I found this on the right side of the colon. And then more frequently than not, they may correct the the read. And so I've just sort of gotten into the habit of being a little bit more suspicious for right-sided colon polyps that are of a certain size, typically greater than 10 millimeters or so. So to recap for the audience, because we, we're we used to seeing hyperplastic polyps on a report, and I'm usually like, okay, good, as long as they're s- smaller than 10 millimeters, like it's it's not something I'm worried about. And then you're saying that usually when those are there, as an endoscopist, you're like, okay, I found this on in the recta, rectum or sigmoid colon. I found this is the left side that's more consistent with a hyperplastic. But if you find something that looks like a hyperplastic on the right side, you know, you might be more suspicious that it's a sessile serrated polyp, which does have more of a malignant potential and gets you, gets your, um, I guess, gets you kind of keyed in like, okay, I gotta, I gotta think about this person. Maybe they're making this type of polyp and really look out for it. Correct. So Elena, what's, uh, what do you want to, how do you want to tackle this? Um, cause I, I know we have a lot to get to a lot of different types of polyps and we sort of laid out the groundwork here. So what do you want to go next with this? Uh, so I, I actually, I was just thinking, you know, speaking of things that are hard to find, we could talk a little bit about the prep and kind of what the specifics of different types of prep, uh, and then also, the importance of a good bowel prep or adequate. So there are a variety of ways to achieve colon cleansing, which is really key in um, in having a high quality colonoscopy. And I just want to mention that in all of the guidelines for surveillance after polypectomy, we're all assuming a high quality colonoscopy. If we don't have high quality colonoscopy, then those guidelines do not apply. And I'll get into that in a little bit. But when it comes to bowel preps, um, we we know we have the tried and true uh, go lightly or new lightly, which is, you know, a gallon of of liquid. Um, Our guidelines have shown and the data has shown that uh, patients who do split dose preps, which means that they take half of the prep, maybe 12 hours before the colonoscopy, and then the other half of the prep start at maybe six hours before when they're going to have their colonoscopy and finish it at least, finish drinking at least two hours uh, prior to them being sedated, that those sh- those end up having the best types of preps. We've also, you know, have a variety of newer preps that are uh, very well tolerated, that are much lower in volume, um, and they provide uh, great preps. Um, and so my my go to prep is typically uh, Sue prep, in part because that's the prep that I had when I had a colonoscopy, and I had a great <laughs> prep. Um, but it's it's pretty easy uh, to take. I you know I think one of the things that happens with some of the low volume preps is that patients will become a little bit nauseous, and the uh, guidance for that is you know don't stop, just kind of slow down your drinking. But a lot of them you drink a, a cup full of whatever the prep is, and then chase it with a bunch of water. The key is really uh, modifying your diet for a day or two prior to the colonoscopy. Uh, And that means a low residue diet. So, you know, low fiber, not a lot of seeds and nuts, things that are easy to digest uh, is what you want to do. And if you have a history of constipation or on medicines that... um, that can you know slow down your gut motility or diabetics frequently have a hard time getting an adequate bowel prep so they may sometimes use an extended prep which is which sometimes can mean uh, longer dietary restriction or two days of clear liquids instead of uh, just the one or sometimes e- even additional prep two days prior to the procedure so every endoscopy center will will have their own recommendations for what to do for extended preps for patients who are at high risk for poor preps um, and a variety of uh, preps that are available a lot of it depends on uh, what your insurance covers what other comorbidities you have and uh, local availability during covid we've actually had shortages of bowel preps and so we've had to um, come up with sometimes um, alternatives that we don't normally go to. 
can you can you talk me through who's at risk for poor prep? I mean, you mentioned patients with diabetes, but I just feel there's like nothing more demoralizing when you finally talk the patient into the colonoscopy and you get the report back. And you're like suboptimal yeah. prep, come back and within a year, and you're like, oh, like I've I spent the past four years begging them, and then we have to do it all over again. So what? Right. Who who should I worry most about, or th- consider these sort of longer preps? So generally, um, patients who are diabetic, patients who are on narcotics, um, sometimes. Um, you know, patients who are not very mobile tend to have uh, issues with, you know, cleaning out appropriately because they're just not moving and they have kind of colonic stasis in general. Patients who are who have a history of um, constipation at baseline are, are definitely ones that you are going to want to do an extended bowel prep on. So I wanted to swing back on, uh, so you mentioned, because we want to mention a couple names of preps. I think Sue Prep is one of the low volume preps. Move, sure. a, move a Prep is another one. I, I know locally, it sounds like maybe, so, it depends on what institution at, people might see different names of these, but these, there's a couple different low volume preps. Right. And then can you mention, you said there was a shortage of preps. So people were using, you told us before we started recording, like PEG, uh, polyethylene glycol, and they were then and Gatorade. How does that? How does that one work? Right. So um, the you know the brand name is Miralax, and Gatorade um, is a um, well tolerated bowel prep, it, but it is just not FDA approved for mm-hmm. bowel cleansing prior to colonoscopy. And so it's safe. It uh, is you know a lot of patients like taking it. It gives a reasonably good prep. Um, and it, it really came in handy when the other preps, including ClenPick and Sutab, were not available. And then the the low residue. I was looking. University of Michigan um, has had a, a a handout that they use, and it was just talking about like it, the exact diet that like we tell people to eat for healthy foods, like whole grains and nuts and seeds, and um, a, a high fiber is like exactly what these people don't want. So it's like they want th- like sugar, refined carbohydrates, right. like meats, uh, like some meat and things like that's well, well cooked meat. It seems like that stuff is okay for the low residue, but like milk and dairy, they had the limit. And then the nuts, they had to limit the, the high fiber and the nuts and seeds and stuff. So I thought that was interesting, Paul. I, you know, I geek out on this stuff because I, I want it, it's so practical to be able, when patients are like, what the heck is a low fiber diet to be able to actually have some sort of answer for them? Right. We mentioned before recording that your diet would be a nightmare for any, yeah. most endocrinologists. <laughs> <laughs> right. And this is, this is true, right? Because a lot of the foods that we encourage people to eat in general, so, you know, uh, dried fruit, berries, uh, seeds, nuts, um, lots of vegetables, even raw vegetables, whole grain breads, things like that you know, those are encouraged to have a healthy diet. And um, the, f- the foods that we like you to eat when you're preparing for your colonoscopy are, you know, low residue. So not including those that I just mentioned, but rather white rice, um, refined grain products. So like white breads, pastas, and then um, you, know, you can have eggs, oil, margarine, butter, things like that are all good. And then some soft cooked vegetables, you know, that are very well cooked um, are appropriate for a low residue diet. Well, I'm going to take you out like if, to one of those uh, <laughs> places with the uh, where they cook with all the butter and the guy's got the rice and he's yeah. flipping stuff to people. Yeah, that that no, would be a great say, meal before. Like if- you can just write a prescription for the Waffle House. I'm just, I'm just thinking, like, you might actually be incentivizing a fair number of patients to, to go through colonoscopy. Yeah, it sounds fantastic. Paul, this, this sounds like our road trip eating uh, before. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, for the audience, so we, as we talked about here, low residue diet, uh, it's it's kind of not the normal diet we'd recommend for our patients when they're eating healthy. And then the low volume preps seem like they work and some patients seem to, seem to like them better. So uh, I guess a lot of people are moving moving more that way. You may, And you told us that the, the SU prep, if patients have a sulfa allergy, that might be an issue. So that's just something for people to look out for. Right, a sulfate allergy and gout okay. um, are the are the key um, contraindications to that, and the same thing with the SUTAB. And then, you know, in some of the other ones, you have to uh, look for, you know, arrhythmias or things like that. Any kind of cardiac issues, sometimes the the low volume ones are not suitable for those. Okay, and so they they would start this. A day or two before, if they have any of these predisposing conditions where we're just worried that they're prone to constipation or just like, uh, then then we would start this earlier. And I think uh, I think that's good. So I think that's a lot of practical information the audience can give to their people before the prep. Uh, so what's what's next, Elena? 
All right. So let's say Janet had a very good prep. She drank all the Gatorade. And her gastroenterologist completed three snare polypectomies. The histology reports that there were three tubular adenomas. They were all less than 10 millimeters in size. And a repeat colonoscopy was recommended in three years. So now getting to the the guidelines for post polyp surveillance, what would be recommended for follow-up in this case now based on the updated guidelines and just what are some of those big changes and how do you categorize them? Sure. So, and actually, I'm sorry. Before we get there, I just said, would it be worth talking? So, Elena, you mentioned this patient had good prep, mm-hmm. and Jen had alluded to this earlier. Is this the time to sort of talk about what that means? Because I sometimes I see on the reports the good versus adequate versus suboptimal. And I, it always kind of feels like someone's just winging their description of it, but I imagine there's some criteria that actually has some significance. Is now the time to talk about that, or should we save that for another time? Let's do it. I think that sounds great. So we're um, looking for a high-quality colonoscopy, and that means a, a number of things in addition to the quality of, of the bowel prep. Um, that means that the exam was complete to the cecum. So usually um, in the colonoscopy report, it'll say how far the scope was advanced to. So you're looking for cecum or terminal ileum in somebody who hasn't had surgery. And then the adequacy of the bowel prep, at minimum, you want adequate. And what that is implying is that the bowel prep was adequate to detect polyps that are greater than five millimeters in size. Um, There are a variety of scales, and some colonoscopists will use the Boston bowel prep or, uh, you know, other types of scales to indicate an adequate bowel prep. Um, Good, excellent, adequate, those are all above the threshold for what we need fair, suboptimal, or poor are things that are red flags, which indicate that the bowel prep was not adequate to detect polyps. And therefore, our recommendations that may you know, follow from polypectomy are not necessarily applicable. Um, and it's also important, um, colonoscopists are graded, or at least kind of, you know, there's surveillance on us about how good we are at finding adenomas. And most endoscopy centers will have their colonoscopists calculate an an adenoma detection rate. And that means that in patients who are average risk, who have a good quality bowel prep, we find adenomas in at least 30% in men and at least 20% in women on their first screening colonoscopy. Yeah. And I didn't realize, do you detect polyps, like when you're trying to reach the cecum or the terminal ileum, is that when you're looking for polyps or is it when you're withdrawing the scope? Because I know they mentioned like you should take a really long time to withdraw the scope. Like I thought you just get there and then you just pull it out like a magician (laughs) pulling a (laughs) tablecloth. Starting a lawnmower. (laughs) Starting a lawnmower. Yeah, like that. Yeah. So actually when we go in, I, I think it's best to try to Uh, insufflate as minimally as possible and get there as um, efficiently as possible because the scope kind of warms up as it's in the body and it becomes um, more difficult to navigate. Sometimes the longer that you're, the longer time you're taking to get to the cecum. So I tend to kind of keep an eye out in the corner of my eye for things on the way in, but the vast, you know, almost all of the looking I'm doing is on the way out. And that's, you brought up a great point. We, you know, we recommend at least a six minute, an absolute bare minimum of six minutes withdrawal time. Uh, And that's in the setting of finding no polyps. So we want to be able to withdraw over the course of at least six minutes. And obviously that time increases as we spend time removing polyps. That's that's actually another quality indicator in colonoscopy. As Paul suggested, starting a lawnmower is not a (laughs) pull out like you're starting a lawnmower. That's not a... Definitely not. Not This episode's going great, Paul. We're really showing our maturity. <laughs> my, my major contribution to the episode was that metaphor. Yeah, we can. Yeah. And, and then I just want to mention about as we're applying these guidelines. So, you know, if you have these guidelines, you know, printed out, there's some language that that's important to define. And so, an advanced adenoma, for example, is is something that is either. 10 millimeters in size, or it could have advanced histology, so that means tubulovillus or villus, or it could have high-grade dysplasia. Those things qualify as an advanced adenoma. This episode is sponsored by Green Chef. As I've said before, I really appreciate Green Chef because as someone who knows how to cook a little bit but doesn't know how to season food or how to pair things together. Green Chef makes it easy. The ingredients come prepackaged. I mix them together. I follow the recipe, and it makes me seem like I actually know how to cook like a pro. 
Green Chef is now offering more customization than ever before with new organic and wild-caught protein options. You can choose from 24 weekly recipes with the option to mix and match meals from different preferences. So, for instance, maybe you want to order vegan one day and keto the next day. Well, they will let you do that, and that is super cool because Green Chef has options for every lifestyle, whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, etc., so what are you waiting for? Go to greenchef.com slash curb135 and use the code curb135 to get $135 off across five boxes and your first box ships free. Once again, that's greenchef.com slash curb135 and use the code curb135 to get $135 off. Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well. I wanted to ask because we and we're talking about uh, so the USPSTF tells us like let's say we're following when they tell us to screen people and they're talking about average risk patients. Um, can you talk a little bit about and these guidelines seem like they also apply to average risk patients. Um, can you talk us a little bit about like what makes someone a higher risk patient um, or how they become a higher risk patient like if they if they didn't start out as one. Sure. So patients are average risk. The most common way that patients are average risk is that they have no family history of colon cancer. So patients with a family history of colon cancer or advanced polyps in a first degree relative that qualifies as uh, increased risk for colon cancer. Patients with inflammatory bowel disease are also considered at risk at higher risk for colon cancer. Um, Obviously, patients who have any kind of like hereditary syndrome associated with an increased risk. Or if they personally have had colon polyps or colon cancer, they're going to be considered a higher than average risk. So if somebody has a brother that had like a one centimeter polyp with like high grade dysplasia, then, you know, we're considering that person now a higher than average risk. High risk. Yep. Yeah. We would actually put that that person in the same category as somebody who had a brother with colon cancer prior to the age of 60. Mm. Okay. So really we should be talking. It's interesting because I feel like I've never heard a patient tell me anything about their family members' polyps, you know? Right. They might know they had polyps, but never that much information. Right. But if they have that information, it's like a goldmine. And it's sometimes challenging for us because, you know, I'll ask these questions when I'm trying to categorize them, you know, to determine what their interval should be, if they are higher risk or not. And they'll say some things that make me suspicious, but it's not, it's not, completely accurate information. And so I have to make a judgment call sometimes about, you know, how how big was the polyp and how many times did they have polyps and did they have to have surgery for the polyp and stuff like that. So the advanced adenoma thing, I mean, that was something that I don't know that that Paul, was that in your vocabulary before recently? I, I, maybe we just weren't paying or I wasn't paying attention. Is that, it seems like it's a newer, newer concept. It's, I, it's, it's, it's language I'd not heard used until probably the past couple of years yet. So I'm, I'm right there with you forever that's worth. So, so the advanced adenoma, it, it's, you said it's like, certainly if there's dysplasia, if it's greater than a, 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 a one, sorry, 10 millimeters or one centimeter. And can you repeat what else makes it an advanced adenoma? Right. So not just the presence of dysplasia because mm. The adenomas, by definition, have some degree of dysplasia, Mm -hmm. usually low-grade dysplasia. Tubulovillus or villus histology or high-grade dysplasia make it advanced. Okay. Or if it's larger than a centimeter in size. Okay. So what's what's next for our patient here, Elena? What are what are we going to give her on the? Do do we go through her pathology yet? Yeah. So she had a an adequate prep and. They detected three polyps that were less than 10 millimeters in size on the PATH report. They were noted to be tubular adenomas. They were not uh, considered advanced adenomas. And at that time, a repeat colonoscopy was recommended in three years. So thinking about overall, I, I think it'd be helpful to think through her case. So now with changes in the guidelines, when would recommended follow-up be but then also like maybe the most common categories for follow up or how you group these together could be helpful right so so for our patient a 3 year follow up is not wrong 
the task force now recommends a three to five year repeat colonoscopy for those with three to four adenomas that are all less than 10 millimeters in size. And they actually favor more of a five year surveillance just based on some of the studies that they had included, recognizing that it was all based on low quality evidence. Um, so like I said, in the case of Janet, three years is not wrong, but five years is probably a bit favored. I will tell you that I do not like ha uh, having a range. And part of the reason I don't like having a range is because for our um, endoscopy note writing software, we can actually generate recalls from our center if it's a finite amount of time. And so I tend to favor one discrete kind of number instead of a range, because if there's a range, that won't generate a recall. Whereas three years or five years or four years will all generate a recall. A range will not generate a recall. And just so for our internal quality control, when we're getting back in touch with our patients, hey, you had a colonoscopy, you know, two and a half years ago, you're due to come back in three years. Let's start setting it up. That is kind of another layer of quality that I like to have. Yeah, a lot of times now I'm getting the report sometimes at the same time as the gastroenterologist or sometimes I'll get the report and it won't really it won't say exactly, or the patient has left a previous doc and that doctor is no longer around that we can contact them. So I have to sort of decide if it's a three or a five-year follow-up. Is there one thing that would push you to the shorter side of the, these ranges that they give uh, rather than the long size, the longer side? I think that if this person had a family history, right? Because if they had a family history of colon cancer and that was in, you know, a first degree relative less than age 60, if they were, if there were no polyps, that person would be in five years. And so now we're finding, um, you know, three or more polyps in somebody with a couple of those, you know, with, with a couple of now high risk things going on. So I, I tend, I would tend to favor a shorter interval. Yeah. Cause the, the range is really, they they really vary. Um, some some of the ranges are five to ten years, um, and it, it it just depends. So th this person, if they had had the just one to two adenomas, then they could be, and they're both, and they're less than ten millimeters. Then they could it could have been a seven or even a, a full ten year follow up if they were average risk. Right. And um, right. and are you also similarly like making it a ten year rather than the seven year? I don't always feel comfortable doing that. Yeah. Um, honestly, I, I tend to make it seven years because, right. because, you know, colonoscopy is not perfect, right? And we miss lesions all the time. And sometimes the prep is not perfect. It's adequate, but it's not great. And I, I just think I, I tend to favor a little bit of a shorter interval, although this is really not data-based, right? I mean, I'm, I'm probably not saying anything that's data-driven and in, in you know, honestly, the data would actually suggest to be more, uh, you know, more liberal with the, the with uh, letting them go to ten years. But you know, interval colon cancers do happen, and I think part of it is uh, patients' expectations as well play into it. They're like, "Oh, I have polyps, and you're going to treat me as if I didn't have any polyps, and they were precancerous." And so, some of it is also patient comfort. Does the size, so say like nine millimeters versus four millimeters, does that affect? your range that you choose? Uh, I think it would, because if they were all kind of bigger, um, you know, less than a centimeter, but eight or nine millimeters in size, um, that would also push me towards recommending three years rather than five. I love that question because I feel like the 10 millimeters, it's such a nicely round number. It feels like it's actually just something out of comfort rather than based on evidence. <laughs> and I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying 10 seems like a number I would pick if I was going to pick a number I need to remember, not but it, something based on like an average size. It's also very subjective, right? So we don't have our like our ruler out during the colonoscopy, right? There are a couple of different visual cues that we use to measure the size of a polyp. Right. But it's pretty subjective. And sometimes it's not uncommon. I'll look at a polyp and be like, yeah, it's six millimeters. And then my partner will be like, oh, that's eight. And then somebody else will say, no, that's four. <laughs> you know, so there is a level of subjectivity to it as well. So we've, we've talked a little bit here. There, there's figure one in the task force, um, in, in the task force guidelines. It has a nice, nice flow chart here that tells you 
the 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 range of follow up based on how many polyps they had and the size of the polyps and the type of, the type of the polyps. So people definitely should bookmark that and and have that around so that they can they can pick. And we talked about the the shorter follow ups going to be for people who have more. The more you have, like the 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 shorter the follow up. And then if there's any of this like villus or tubulo villus or high grade dysplasia, those are going to be the shorter follow ups. Uh, in general, we're just painting in broad strokes here. I don't think people are going to be memorizing these as we're talking on air, right? And the what uh, part of what I thought was interesting now because I, I I remember it seemed like and maybe this was just my misunderstanding of the previous guidelines that if someone had a single adenoma, they were five year follow up for the rest of their life. You know what that they're getting colonoscopies. And can you talk about now? So they get their index colonoscopy. They have, let's say they have three, this, this patient here, three polyps. Uh, we repeat the colonoscopy in five years and now they have nothing. It's, it's clean. There's no polyps. Uh, does that person go back to the average risk category and, and get a, a 10 year follow-up? Right. So if they had what's called low risk adenoma, so one or two small ones, and then their follow-up colonoscopy, there was no polyps, they would go back to 10 years. Okay. But the, but people that have like uh, th- three, three adenomas or like that they wouldn't, they wouldn't necessarily go to that 10 year. They would go to a, they would go to five years, a five year follow up. Okay. But yep. still, um, okay. So five year follow up, but if they're, but if it's that person that has one or two every time, to- uh, that first time they can, they can be blessed with a 10 year follow up for their, right. for their third colonoscopy. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. And the idea of, you know, being um, permanently on the five-year plan, that is really only applicable if they have a family history of colon cancer in a first-degree relative or, you know, an advanced adenoma in a first-degree relative prior to the age of 60. Mm-hmm. Paul, I think you had a question because does this ever come up for you, Paul, where like you you get the colonoscopy and then someone's like, I'm done with those things. Like, I, I just want to do like fit testing from now on. You ever get those patients? I, I do a lot, actually. Yeah, yeah. I thought I thought this was a question you wanted to delve into. Yeah, that it was. Yeah, I, I and we talked a little about this before we start recording. I guess yeah. How interchangeable are the tests, and sort of when might you go back to fit DNA testing? Because I do have patients who are like, I don't want to go through that again. Usually, they have their. Every so often, I have these patients that will they'll have undergone the colonoscopy, and and I will make the point that most patients are like that was not nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be. But every so often, I have patients who it's it's really burdensome for them to take the day off and get a ride home and all that kind of stuff, and they'll be like, can I can I go back to something else or can we do other types of testing? So I guess my question for you is how in what in what circumstances is it okay to sort of deescalate? Is how I think about it, though maybe not right to like fit DNA testing, and what are circumstances where really that's probably not a great option. So this is a great question, and it comes up all the time, um, especially as we're dealing with our primary care providers. The FIT DNA testing and FIT testing, those are all reasonable alternatives to colonoscopy for colon cancer screening. And when we're talking about screening, those are patients that um, that are have never had colon polyps, have never had precancerous polyps, and are also considered average risk. Those, ten, those tests don't really apply to patients who either have a prior history of colon polyps that are precancerous, so adenomas or sessile serrated lesions, or if they're considered high risk for one of the reasons that I had mentioned before. Um, realistically, um, so, you know, so somebody could have a colonoscopy and then they're due again for another, you know, another colonoscopy 10 years later, they want to have a fit DNA test. That's completely reasonable. Or if they want to have an annual fit test, completely reasonable. Um, however, for patients who have had adenomas or are considered high risk, we really don't recommend those tests. Now, some testing, I would argue, is better than no testing. So if this is somebody who is absolutely not going to have a colonoscopy, I think it's reasonable to use those tests as a compromise, but kind of documenting what the rationale was for using that, because that's really not how the tests were designed. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I was reading, it seemed like there's a little bit, like let's say someone had one to two small adenomas. Um, on their first colonoscopy, the second colonoscopy was, had nothing, you know, can you go to a fit test at that point? It seems like probably that's, that's a lower risk person, but if they, if they had adenomas and they haven't had another colonoscopy yet, you're saying like, you know, the fit test is better than nothing, but you'd rather have another colonoscopy when, whenever they were due for follow-up rather than no, no colonoscopy. Right. 
Yeah, it's tough, but I mean, like it, 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 in practice, like we're constantly negotiating with people about what they will and won't do. And, uh, it's, it's, I, I guess sometimes you just have to, <laughs> it's, I guess it's kind of like harm reduction, Paul. You're just like, you know, it's better than, it's better than nothing. Yeah. I will use it uh, with the mind, like this, the science behind this is not great, but maybe it's the spur to actually get the thing that needs to get done, done mm-hmm. is kind of how I think about it sometimes. I feel like it's like you said, compromise is the exact right word. So Jen, I, I guess part of, you know, we're talking about patients maybe not wanting colonoscopy. I think part of that is fear or they just don't want to do the bowel prep or it's disruptive to their life. But like there are some risks with colonoscopy. Can you talk a little bit about like how how common are complications and like what are what complications might might we talk to patients about um, if they're worried? Sure. Um, so we always, you know, go through the risk of complications with the patient and they're always afraid that they're going to, you know, suffer some horrendous complication at the time of, that they're consenting. However, colonoscopy is generally a very well tolerated procedure. And even with polypectomy, we, we're pretty good at doing it. Um, most polypectomy bleeding is, you know, one to 2%. However, um, in patients who need a larger resection, so if they need a technique called endoscopic mucosal resection to get out a larger, meaning like greater than two centimeter flat polyp, that risk can go as high as five to 10%. And the bleeding can be immediate or delayed. We generally remove polyps with a tool called a snare. And that snare can, we can either kind of guillotine polyps off with this thin wire of the snare, or we can attach that snare to electrocautery and um, use uh, cautery to, to take off the polyps. We generally see delayed bleeding, which means like up to three weeks after their colonoscopy, actually. Um, that it happens more frequently when we use cautery or a hot snare. Aside from bleeding, the next big risk is perforation. And it's a low risk, but if it happens, it can you know potentially require a surgery to fix. Um, and so that is also uh, quite low, but can be as high as five to you know five percent in cases of uh, endoscopic mucosal resection or submucosal dissection. Now it's also important to note that these are not standard colonoscopy numbers, right? So these are you know numbers that are associated with removing large polyps. Uh, in generally, the risk of perforation for just polypectomy is much less than one percent. And then another thing that can happen in the setting of using electrocautery from uh, taking off polyps is something called post-polypectomy syndrome. And that uh, is due to a transmural burn uh, to the bowel wall. And it actually uh, causes a little bit of a focal peritonitis, but no evidence of a clear perforation. And patients will have some abdominal pain. They may have an elevated white count. They may mount a fever, actually, within a day or up to five days after having a polypectomy. And we usually manage those conservatively. Sometimes they require a hospitalization, even get IV fluids and you know antibiotics, bowel rest. Um, but frequently, patients can be managed outpatient-wise with just some clear liquids and bowel, you know, bowel rest. And Jen, for the the bleeding specifically, how how is that defined? You may not know the answer to that, but is that bleeding sufficient to to warrant sort of a follow up visit? Is this like how like do you know what they're actually calling bleeding? Is that that's a higher number than I actually would have expected? Yeah. So the the bleeding that you know we worry about is when somebody goes home and then they start having a lot of bowel movements and it's hematochesia it's bright red blood and you know um blood is a cathartic so people will go to the go to the bathroom more frequently and if that's not calming down then we have patients come to the ER to at least get their blood checked give them some fluids and kind of monitor them and then the next step is usually starting a bowel prep and if the bleeding stops during the course of that bowel prep we don't necessarily need to do another colonoscopy because most of them will stop on their own now it's very common to see um, after a colonoscopy and polypectomy especially if we're using cold snare patients will have you know streaks of blood or even you know a tablespoonful or two of blood um, you know after after their scope um, and that's not really anything to worry about. Yeah, we and we hold full anticoagulation like the the DOAX and and warfarin those things before colonoscopy. But uh, aspirin or other antiplatelets, are you holding those a uh, specific amount? Like th- just things that come up. I usually, I think I'm not usually even talking to the patient about that because the I think the endoscopist is telling them directly. So our guidelines recommend continuing aspirin for everyone um, for colonoscopy with polypectomy, um, but we generally will hold Plavix and uh, Warfarin for a couple of days and the other DOAX, uh, we'll we'll hold those as well. Mm -hmm. And then the resumption of those is based on kind of what we did. 
and how you know aggressive we were. So if if there was no polyps, we can they can start the same day. If there was a couple of small little polyps, they can maybe start the next day. But if we did like endoscopic mucosal resection, we want them to hold it if they can for you know maybe three to five days. That's helpful. And I think one other thing we wanted to touch base on was, you know, we learn about a lot of these polyposis syndromes in our training, don't as often see them, but what are some of the things on a colonoscopy report that should make us think about the potential of a polyposis syndrome uh, or things we should be watching out for? Sure. So, you know, with the polyposis syndromes, and we're talking about familial adenomatous polyposis or attenuated familial adenomatous polyposis or FAP. We're talking about serrated polyposis syndrome and then Poitiers and familial juvenile polyposis. So for FAP, those patients are, you know, have a carpet of polyps throughout their, their colon. So we'll see hundreds to thousands of adenomatous polyps. And that is really associated with 100% lifetime risk of developing colon cancer. So those patients um, are referred for genetic testing and then to the colorectal surgeons. There's also an entity called attenuated FAP. And that's when we see, you know, between 10 and 100 adenomatous polyps. And they're more frequently on the right side of the colon. But it's also associated with a higher risk of, uh, you know, substantial risk of developing colon cancer up to about 80%. Some more subtle things are the serrated polyposis syndrome. And for those, you don't really need to have huge numbers of polyps. Um, for example, you can have five serrated polyps that are more proximal to the rectum, um, of which two of them are uh, greater than one centimeter or larger. Um, other criteria for that are greater than 20 of those serrated polyps, um, or if you have serrated polyps and you have a family history of serrated polyposis syndrome. So those are some of the things that we that we look for during the, the colonoscopy. And, and also, if somebody continues to have multiple colon polyps every time they get a colonoscopy, that would also uh, cue me off a little bit. And the serrated polyposis syndrome, that's total for any colonoscopy or within one colonoscopy? So it's generally within one colonoscopy. I'd actually have to look this up to see if if it's a lifetime accumulation of, you know, five polyps. Yeah. Or, you know, I'd have to look that up actually. And and the reason, I guess, the serrated polyposis syndrome, and really all of them, would matter is because this the surveillance and screening would change? Right. Well, it's not so much that it matters for that patient, but it matters for that patient's family members. Yeah. Okay. Right. And so if they have a polyposis syndrome, then their first degree family members may also be at risk for that. Oh, I see. Yeah. Because they would still be getting surveillance based on their polyp. Okay. Right. So I, I think we're I think we're pretty close to the end of this. We did ask you ahead of time about older adults and it sound like the people in the 75 to 85 range and it sounds like you you go mostly by the what's their biological age, not their chronological age. So if they're like an 80-year-old who had polyps at 75 and they're due for a follow-up, but they're doing great, they're driving, they're still as healthy as they were at 75, you might still do it, but it's it sounds like it was uh, it, it sort of depends on how healthy the patient is and what the situation is and anything else that you talk to them about if you're it, when people are getting towards that like 80 and above range uh, where a lot of people want to stop. Right. So that's I actually put it in my note, you know, say, you know, if these are adenomatous polyps and we would recommend a repeat colonoscopy in three years time would only pursue that if this patient clinically is doing as well as they were at the time of this colonoscopy. So please have a conversation with your primary care provider at that time. Um, You know, a lot of patients are risk averse and and they like knowing that they're, um, they're, that colon cancer is kind of not going to get them. Um, And then others don't want anything to do with it. Others, you know, even who are just age 70 are like, oh, this is going to be my last colonoscopy ever. But when we're taking polyps off each and every time, those are people who I continue surveillance on. For patients who have reached the age of 75 who have never had colon polyps, it's pretty unlikely that they're going to develop colon polyps. And so I can understand why they might want to stop screening, and that's reasonable, but I, th- I still think it's worth a conversation. Okay, Jen, if you if you don't want to give the audience like maybe two or three things that you really want them to remember about what we talked about tonight. And uh, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank your family for our time. I think the kids are <laughs> eating down the door. So we'll let you get back to them now. 
Great. I hope I hope that they won't, you know, have disrupted this podcast. But my main take home points for primary care providers or anybody listening to this podcast are really please take the time to review your colonoscopy reports and pathology reports on your patients. Try to have a good relationship with your gastroenterologist or other providers who are doing these scopes. Keep in mind that the guidelines are always uh, in process and recommendations change over time. And it's important to really be diligent with the guidelines because sometimes even the gastroenterologists are misappropriating follow-up recommendations. Additionally, if your patient undergoes an alternative method for colon cancer screening, try to ensure that they're eligible for those types of tests. So high-risk individuals and those with a history of precancerous polyps kind of outside of what we talked about should probably undergo colonoscopy. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. Get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com, and while you're there, sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. Plus, twice each month, you'll get our new Curbsiders Digest, recapping the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. And we're committed to high-value practice-changing knowledge, and to do that, we need your feedback, so please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. You can also email us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. A reminder that this and most episodes are available for free CME through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. A special thanks to our fantastic writer and producer for this episode, Dr. Elena Gibson, and to our whole team, The Curbsiders is produced and edited by the team at Podpace. Elizabeth Proto runs our social media, and Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. And with all that, Paul, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. Elena Gibson here. And as always, our main Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams, thank you and goodbye.